Hey everybody, today will be a long but very interesting video. I spent many days at work filming this video. We conducted an experiment where we cast a silver pendant in the most domestic conditions possible. Throughout this process, we'll even be using raw potatoes. We've also added narration to this video. Let us know in the comments what you think about it. I thought that a pendant made from a Coca-Cola bottle cap would look cool and unusual, but I didn't think that I would have so much trouble working on it. This time, we're not going to cut anything out. We're going to show you how the whole process actually went. I'm going to do the first shape on a vulcanizer. Hold on. Before you go to the comments and complain that these aren't domestic conditions, know that this process can be done with your hands, using silicone. The only difference is that the rubber will harden in an hour, while the silicone will take a day. Just be patient and watch. While the rubber is being vulcanized, it's time for us to make the second element of the pendant. I have an old silicone mold in my workshop. You could just as well take a Kinder Surprise toy or a little Lego man and make a silicone mold of it. By combining different styles, you can create truly unique products. Since I'm using a syringe, producing a defect is inevitable. And well, that's okay. I make copies until I get a quality that I'm satisfied with. One that can then be reworked by hand. So far, everything is going according to plan. The timer went off, which means the rubber in the vulcanizer has baked, and we can start cutting. And so, here's our form. I made several cuts across to vent the air as I fill it with wax. I get the heated wax into the syringe and pump it into the mold. That didn't work. Either the wax is too cold, or the bottle cap is too thin. I'll keep trying. After a dozen unsuccessful attempts, I decided to modify the mold by cutting some rubber off the inside wall. The surface started to turn out pretty well, but the sides of the bottle cap didn't. Let's cut some rubber off there too then. I mean, what do we have to lose? It looks better now, but it needs some work. I made my chisel for this kind of work a long time ago using a normal ballpoint pen. I add the missing volume to the skull and add more mass to the jaw.
Out of habit, I took a wax heater. If you don't have one at home, you can use a nail or a candle. I thought that it would look more interesting with an open jaw. For this part, I improvised as I went. Let me remind you, this video is an experiment. If someone wants to share their own experience, please leave a comment. It'll be interesting to hear. polished every trace that the tool left with a cotton swab moistened with solvent. It dissolves the wax well and smoothens out any irregularities. I decided that it would be better to be safe than sorry, and made a silicone mold of the final wax model, so that if there were to be a problem, I would be able to make it again. In the end, I had a lot of use for this. I added material to the top to fill the form evenly, and the air will be flowing out through the cuts. As you can see, I didn't mix the components based on guesswork. I used the scales. Even I didn't dare trust my experience and mix based on guesswork alone. And yet, if you choose casting as a hobby, you still have to buy the necessary minimum equipment for a good result. The next day, it's time to take the wax out of the silicone. By gently cutting the mold, I remove the wax without damaging anything. Beginner craftsmen who are just starting out don't have a vacuum for quality molding, so we'll have bubble traces too. Here's the first result. I wasn't patient enough to wait for the wax to solidify a bit, and some of it ended up coming off. 
or because it was crammed in the mold. We'll keep that in mind as we cut the mold to have an easier time removing the workpiece from it. On the inside, the teeth make up the upper point of the model, which are filled with wax last, which means that all the air accumulated in the mold is directed towards them, which is why the teeth did not spill over. I make holes in the form to drain the air and fill the rubber band completely with wax. Here we go, let's try. Look, all the teeth are perfectly filled out, which means we've fixed the second flaw. Now there's a little problem with the nose and eye sockets, but it didn't happen last time, which means it's not critical. The quality of the form is questionable, but viable. The little wax figurines can be fine-tuned, which means now we can move on to casting. Convert the sprue into a frame. Metal entering the mold should fill it with the least resistance. I'll use small nails and a piece of pipe that I duct tape to keep the plaster from flowing through a burned hole, and I'll use plasticine as a rubber base. Unlike silicone, plaster is less fickle in terms of proportions and I allow myself this time to mix it by eye. Throughout this, I use a special casting compound. It would be good to put the mold through a vacuum and on a vibrating table, but I'll try to do my best by tapping a spoon. I put the mold in a pot and put it on the burner at maximum heat. This way, we can pour the wax out of the mold and heat it up a bit. But keep in mind, when the wax burns, there will be a lot of smoke. We're gonna need some ventilation. 
This is how I've been heating my molding box for 4 hours. I use wet toilet paper, but anything fits, paper, clay, potatoes, beetroot, and so on. The idea is to get a damp, malleable substance from which when pressed against the hot workpiece, moisture will evaporate and create pressure in the formed hole. This will make it possible to squeeze the metal into a mold. If the substance is too stiff, there is a chance that it will not close tightly and steam will seep through the cracks. If the substance is too wet, water will squeeze out when pressed and fall in the metal, which will immediately solidify it before being poured into the mold. Immediately after stewing on the stove, I decided to heat the mold with gas. I heated it up until the steel mold began to glow. It took less than half an hour, the plaster cracked from the heat and the insides didn't have time to heat up. It's important to pay more attention to heating the form up, and there's a reason why calcination cycles last for 7 to 15 hours with a smooth rise in temperature up to 800 degrees. For the product's material, I will be using 30 grams of silver, 925 standard. Silver has quite a low melting point compared to brass and is easy to process. When the metal finally melts, we need to squeeze it sharply and firmly with our workpiece. I was worried and, for good reason, judging by the amount of metal in the funnel, the experiment failed. The mixture, while I've been practicing, never got to be an earthly color. Apparently it was quite raw and it didn't let the metal spill over. The moisture from the plaster began to evaporate sharply when the hot metal was poured. Calcination is one of the most important stages of casting. That's why there's no preparation here. We need to make something that at least resembles a muffle kiln out of 10 bricks. I made a new wax figurine and turned on my muffle kiln. At the same time, I made another molding box with all the processes in mind. Vacuuming the plaster, calcinating in the muffle kiln, melting metal in the furnace, and casting in a vacuum. We'll compare the results later. I took the potatoes to prepare the substance for pouring. Well, what are you gonna do? Ruined again. This time the surface is much smoother. The detail is higher, meaning the calcination of the molding box worked. But while I was carrying the muffle kiln to the table, it cooled down. I didn't take that into account when I set the final calcination temperature. Let's give it one more day and one more try. I added 200 degrees beyond what it takes to fill properly. That should be enough for me to melt the metal. Because of the high temperature of the molding box, the metal in it started to melt more efficiently. Perfect.
Ouch, I got burned. I was rushing and I felt that I was already experienced enough. I awkwardly pressed the potatoes and formed a slot through which a jet of stream burst out right into my finger. Sometimes, the feeling of being experienced in something is only in our heads. I think that's a sign. I think it's time to end these attempts. So let's move on to casting, keeping all the processes in mind. Excellent detail, no air bubbles. Good, I was starting to feel like I forgot how to cast. Looking more closely at the cast, I realized that I didn't draw the accordion into the back of the cap. Details are a sign of skill. For this piece, I decided not to solder the hanging bits, opting to drill holes instead. And I decided to paint over it like the original cap. I like the look of the pendant, and I'll put it with the rest, but maybe with a little more work. In the meantime, I'm going to sign the very first cap, to which we've devoted an entire video showcasing its creation. And now we can draw some conclusions. You don't have to be a sculptor to craft something. You can look for inspiration in objects around you, combine them, and create something unique. Try, make mistakes, analyze those mistakes, and try again. Anyway, here's the result for today. If you like this video, I'll keep trying until I reach some kind of result. And if not, well, I'll think of something else. <laughs>